Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's voting meeting. And we'll start with the pledge to the flag and moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mrs. Donahay. Here. Mr. Alling. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Koch. Present. Ms. Lynch. Here. Mr. Miller. I'm here. Mr. Probert. Mrs. Smith. Present. And Mr. Stroud. Here. Okay. We're going to start things off tonight with a presentation uh, from Dr. Barnhart. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Going to share my screen here. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it works for me. Are you able to see my screen? Not no, yet. no, not yet. We'll try it again. Any luck now? Nope. Nope. Um, Chad, are you able to share that for her from the agenda? Yep, give me one second, I'll share it out. Thank you. Yep. She'll, she'll just have to tell him when to turn the page. Okay, sorry about that, Chad. Not a problem, Dr. Barnhart, not a problem. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, sir. yes thanks, Chad. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So thank you, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I just wanted to speak with you this evening about Keystone Central School District gifted education programs. Um, as many of you may know, or maybe you do not know, Keystone Central was selected this school year to, school year to participate in a monitoring. Um, with special education, there's a cyclical monitoring process. So every school year, six years, you know that you are going to be monitored um, for compliance. With gifted, it's more of a lottery. They just make that determination um, when they feel like it's time to come and see you again. So we were selected this year um, for our monitoring. Um, Chad, you can go to the next screen. So um, one thing that I just want to talk about a little bit is child find and our obligation to make sure that we are responsible for making sure that children who are school age living within our district and even if they are not enrolled or in our district are aware of gifted services and what gifted services might mean. So we need to make sure that we are sharing an annual uh, public notice. We often do that in newspapers, a website. Um, we always list gifted programming in our student handbooks and trying to have those annual awareness activities, which is something that the district needs to improve uh, upon in the near in the future. And then there needs to be that identification process. What are we doing? What do we have in place to identify students who are in need of gifted services? 
So when I started looking at the monitoring checklist and things that needed to be completed in order to be in compliance and to start the monitoring, the first thing that I took note to was that our district gifted policy needed to be updated and changed. And I thank all of you that was um, voted on earlier on in, in the school board. And we now have a policy that is accurate in the district. Um, but the second thing was that we really did not have guidelines and protocol in place in order to make determinations of how we would find our gifted population and those students who are in our buildings who should be receiving those services. Currently in Keystone Central with a, with a population of 37, roughly 37, 3,800 students, we are only servicing nine students in our gifted programs. So we know there are many more out there. So we are going to be um, using a universal screening. So this is our first level. So next fall, um, when we do our assessment and benchmark data, and I know that Megan Hall spoke with you um, significantly during the work session to talk about our triangles and our MTSS and where our students lie. So when all of our students are being assessed and taking those assessments, we're going to look at that benchmark data in November to see what students qualify for us to pull out to move forward to the next level to see whether or not they may be students who could be eligible or receive um, gifted education programs. So for our K2 students, we'll look at that Ames Web benchmark math and reading assessments and we want them to be above the 90th percentile. So we will pull students out automatically who have scored above that 90th percentile. Go ahead, Chad. Second piece is we'll look at grades three to four. So grades three and four have a little more data that's available to us. We will look at the MAP assessment data, again, the 90th percentile for math and reading, but we will also look at their most recent PSSA data for reading and ELA, and we will be looking for an advanced score in that area. Go ahead, Chad. So next we have fifth through eighth grade, and we have, again, a little more data to be that we can add. So we have the MAP assessment data in math and reading, again, the 90th percentile. We also throw in there the most recent PSSA data for math and ELA, looking for that advanced score. And we're looking at grades, a 95% or higher in all major areas. Um, now, you may wonder why we're not looking at grades for those lower um, K through four students. Our grading report card is a little difficult to um, assess how we might use report card grades to determine giftedness because we have um, a skills-based report card. So in working with our school psychs who helped me develop these guidelines, we determined that we would not look at report cards for those lower grade levels. And typically we stop here at the eighth grade because this is where we would be catching students who are gifted. If they haven't been caught um, prior to moving on to high school, it's not likely that we would be evaluating a student in high school for gifted programs. However, a teacher could um, see some, some extra things in the work that they're providing and doing and feel that there may be giftedness and we can always address that as a team. So the next level brings us into that individual screening. So level one was called the universal screening. So that's something that all of our students do. All of our students K2 take Ames Web Plus. Our students um, three, four, five, eight are using map data. So they all are assessed in February. So again, we look at that data and we pull those students out who are meeting that 90th percentile. And when we have that group of students, we're going to look at them and we're going to give them an additional assessment. And in order to do that, we're going to get permission from parents because in order to provide an assessment that not all students receive, parents must give permission. So we are going to be administering the Kaufman Brief, Brief Intelligence Test. It can be given by a gifted teacher, an interventionist, a counselor, or a school psychologist, but it does not need to be administered by a school psychologist, like many of the other assessments when we move into that gifted evaluation piece. So what we'll be looking for on the K-bit is a score of 125 plus, 
in order to consider moving on to that gifted evaluation. And if the student reaches that score, we'll issue a permission to the parents and um, move forward with the evaluation process. Now, if the score is below that 125, the district would not recommend a full recommendation. However, parents do have the right to request an evaluation. So if they want to move forward, we would issue that permission and assess that child and evaluate them to see if um, there may be some criteria, but it's most likely that they would not qualify. Go ahead, Jen. So in order to conduct that full gifted evaluation, we have to obtain that parent permission. We're going to gather parent and teacher information. We have a referral form that um, teachers fill out and we have specific rating scales and information that parents will fill out to help the school psychologist through this process. The school psychologist will administer, the, administer those comprehensive assessments and they're going to summarize all of that into the gifted written report. Go ahead, Chad. So in order for a student to qualify for gifted education services, they must either demonstrate cognitive intellectual abilities equal to or above the 98th percentile. They must have a full scale IQ of 130 plus. And there's additional criteria um, in, term, in terms of achievement rate of acquisition, early scales and development. Or a student could also qualify if they are in the 95th percentile and their full scale IQ is 125 and they have standardized achievement scores at or above that 95 percentile in math and reading. Go ahead, Chad. So if a student does not qualify at this point, so at this point we've written, did the assessment, the school psych has written the report, we've reviewed it as a team with the parent and we've um, determined that the child does not qualify, does not meet the criteria, the um, district will issue what's called the notice of recommended assignment. And that is the parents' rights, letting them know that their child does not qualify for gifted and that that child would remain in general education. If you issue the NORA to the parents in person, the parents have five days to return that NORA to you, um, agreeing or disagreeing. If you uh, mail the NORA, the parent has 10 days. So depending upon when you get that paperwork back, when you're on the other side of a child who does qualify is when you will know when you're going to implement that document. Okay, Chad, thank you. So eligibility for gifted services. That written report will determine, make that determination if the student's educational needs cannot be met in that general education setting. So a child who needs gifted services needs to have something above and beyond that core instruction. It doesn't mean it has to be something different than the core, but if they need enrichment activities, we can find that right within that, that core um, curriculum. Sometimes they may, they may need more that is not available in the core curriculum, and we could look at different SDI for them, and we'll we talk about that here in a little bit. Um, so next, the gifted written report, the GIP, is written and implemented. Go ahead, Jen. So two things that really must be considered when looking to write that GIEP, when the school psychologist conducts all of their assessments, they really need to make that recommendation and identify the strengths area for the students and PDE um, when they're looking at strengths, they're really not looking across the board. Um, they're looking at ELA and they're looking at math. Um, years prior, gifted services also looked at um, creativity. That is no longer a part of the gifted regs. Um, sometimes you could move into science and social studies based upon, you know, cross-curricular things and based upon teachers who may want to work with a student and challenge them if they have the GIEP with some additional enrichment, but typically we're looking at ELA and math. So some of the things that you could do for a student who does require enrichment, 
would be cluster grouping. So you're grouping a group of students together who are gifted, who have GIPs, giving them the opportunity to work collaboratively, problem solve, create different activities. Um, research shows that when you cluster your gifted students together, they become more productive and they, um, they work very well together in enhancing their education. Another piece of enrichment would be curriculum compacting. So you could assess your student on a third grade unit in math, and that student does very, very well, masters all that content. So you're gonna move them along to the next unit, even though the rest of your students remaining are still working on unit three. That child is working more independently, obviously with support from the teacher, but moving along and, and going into the next unit through curriculum compacting. You could also have a learning contract. Um, sometimes there might be a special project or an interest child um, wants to research or do a little more investigating with. So the teacher and the student come up with a plan, develop this plan and sign a contract about how um, work will be completed and what the outcome will be. Um, another area for enrichment is access to technology, using alternate resources, um, and oftentimes using it a different uh, assessment technique. So not always thinking about that paper pencil assessment. Maybe the students creating a movie on iMovie or um, writing a poem. So there are many, many different ways that we can um, use alternate assessments for our students who need enrichment. Okay, Chad. So another piece of differentiation is acceleration. So the school psychologists, when they're writing their report, need to identify the, area, the student's area of strength, either ELA or math, and they must identify whether that child would benefit from enrichment, acceleration, or both. So some examples of acceleration would be a child who has early entrance into school. Maybe they're going to start school earlier than their typical peers. Um, sometimes it's for students who may jump a grade level. So they may, um, the kindergarten curriculum, they've already mastered, they're already, to, they're already able to do that. They may jump an entire grade level. Um, districts do need to have policies in place to make sure that they are um, providing equity when they're doing those types of things. So it, it looks the same for most students, um, the opportunities. Um, curriculum compacting, that is when the curriculum is condensed and a student may move faster than their peers on that same content. Um, subject acceleration could be pull out programs. Um, the student may remain in that same grade level but work on some higher level um, activities right within that um, general education classroom. Few other areas um, for acceleration are full years. So a student might jump fourth grade and go right on to fifth grade. Um, sometimes we have students who are at the high school level and they complete all of their credits in their junior year and they go right off to college um, a year early. We also have dual enrollment courses at the high school. Um, students taking those college courses simultaneously while they're still enrolled in high school. We have AP courses, um, uh, honors courses, and all of those things that can, com that can provide that acceleration. And then extracurricular activities, I often think that's an area that's forgotten when we're writing the GIEP, that we don't always think of those extracurriculars that we could add on to help the student excel um, both academically and socially. So the GIP process, um, once the student qualifies and we've had the meeting to go over the gifted written report, we will review that report with the parent, the general ed teacher and an LEA. So an LEA is an administrator, myself, a principal, anyone who could be able to speak about what offerings that we could provide, um, provide resources, be fiscally responsible for the district, um, is, is the LEA's role. So we would schedule an issue and invitation for that GIEP meeting. 
the gifted teacher would create the GIEP in collaboration with the general ed teacher. The GIEP meeting would be held. And then we issue that NORA that I mentioned about earlier, which is called the Notice of Recommended Assignment. And this is given to the parent. And again, if it's given to the parent in person, they have five days to return it and accept. And if it's mailed home, they have 10 days. Um, so after we get the NORA back, the GIEP is implemented. And then progress is, is provided to the parent. Um, regs are only or mandate that we provide that progress monitoring to parents annually, but really best practice is to do it quarterly. Special education students receive progress monitoring quarterly. So um, we will talk as we move forward if we want that to be a little more frequently than annually. And then by law, you must have an IEP meeting, GIEP meeting, review and revised at least once a year. So it's an annual process. So the components of the GIP, the present education levels um, really drive what is in the GIP and how you're going to be able to create your goals. And that just consists of your demographics, your participants, um, your present levels of, of educational performance. So a, a battery of tests, it'll list students' curriculum-based assessments, their achievement scores, um, all of those things are listed in that area. Progress on goals, um, their aptitudes, their interests, any special skill sets that they may have, um, their grades and their classroom performance. All of those things are listed in present ed levels. So that gives you a clear picture of the student and what the student is capable of. Then we have our goals and outcomes. So there's an annual goal that will either support that enrichment or that acceleration piece based upon what the team decides. There are short-term learning objectives and then there's specially designed instruction that support those goals. Um, and some of the support services can be enrichment activities. Um, and always we wanna see collaboration between teachers. Um, gifted services really is not about instruction coming from that gifted teacher. The gifted teacher's role is to collaborate with those general education teachers on how to enhance and enrich instruction for the gifted population. So that brings me to the gifted monitoring. Um, and forgive me if I said this, but we were to be scheduled to be monitored in January. And when I started digging into um, completing our gifted facilitated self-assessment, I realized we were missing a lot of components, which would really make monitoring very difficult. And I knew that, that it would really create a lot of areas of improvement and corrective action. So I did reach out to PDE and spoke with Shirley Moyer, who's our point of contact. And she agreed and she was happy that we were being proactive. So she came end of March, um, early April to do the monitoring here in the district. So I'm just going to talk with you just for a few minutes about some of her findings and then the corrective action and what we need to do as a district um, to make things in compliant and to be improved on what we're doing. So the components of the um, gifted educational monitoring are that gifted facilitated assessment. And that's a document that I go through and list, um, you know, guidelines, protocols, gifted policies. Um, are we providing annual notice? Do we have notices in our handbooks? And then you give evidence and show proof that those things are present. There's a file review, which means the students who are gifted. Now, typically in a district who had more than nine students, you would get a random list of, list of students who were pulled for monitoring, but because we only had nine, they were all selected. Um, there's parent interview and then there's teacher interview. So they interview the gifted teachers and general education to support the gifted students in their room. The monitoring report itself looks at the gifted education plan, it looks at personnel, it looks at special education and dual exceptionalities. We do have two students in our district who are both receiving special education and gifted services, and that creates a little bit of a different 
plan that falls under chapter 14 and students receive special education services and those gifted services are embedded in that um, IEP. Um, they go through the screening and evaluation process, placement for gifted education, gifted procedural safeguards, um, and again, that gifted student file review. So one of the areas that was noted uh, for improvement needed was in the development of the gifted IEP. So in looking, going through the file of those nine student files, the GIEP implementation date was not correct in a number of them. The anticipated duration of services was not correct in a number of them. And the students' academic strengths and their current instructional levels did not include multiple data points. So what that means is now we have to correct that. We need to go back and make sure when we're writing these documents in the future that we are doing them accurately. So we will have professional development time dedicated to gifted programming throughout the school year. And this training in particular is really just meant to be for the gifted teachers and administrators. And administrators fall into that part when they are, you know, the LEA. So they are recognizing when they're sitting in an IEP meeting or GIEP meeting that some of these components aren't accurate. So they can be changed during that time right there at the meeting. Go ahead, Chad. So a couple of other areas that were not um, compliant, there was not progress on previous year's academic goals. Um, we didn't have evidence and have any evidence of growth. Um, annual goals were listed and aligned to standards and based on student strengths. So when you write an annual goal, you need to base those on the standards and the goal always needs to be centered around the student's strengths. It's kind of the opposite of special education goal where you're centering those goals around their students' needs and their areas of weakness. Um, you have to develop specially designed instruction and you wanna have objective criteria and assessment procedures are, are clearly described. So again, that will be an area of improvement for gifted teachers and administrators. Go ahead, Chad. And another area is in the development of the GIEP. Um, annual goals are stated and aligned to standards. The goals are responsive to the strengths and the present levels. We have short-term learning objectives. They must lead to the goal um, achievement. Um, support services include collaboration among gifted support and general education teachers. So along with the monitoring process, I mentioned earlier that there's a interview with both parents and with our teachers. And one of the biggest things that came out of the interview with general education teachers is they felt that they were not a part of creating the document. They were not, not a part of creating the gifted individualized education plan. They felt more that the plan was created and they were just shown the plan and expected to help implement that. So that is one of the big areas that we wish to change this year, that we want our gifted teacher to be more of a coach, so to speak, that they are well-versed in curriculum and they are working with classroom teachers to try to enhance through that enrichment and acceleration process, how they can differentiate that instruction to give those students what they need above and beyond the core curriculum. So this is an area where both gifted general education teachers and administrators all need some area of professional development. So because of all of those things that were noted and in all honesty, I'm pleasantly pleased um, I've been through monitorings before where you have pages and pages of things that are not compliant and that you must correct. So I feel that overall, this is not a lot for us to do. And it's a great time to revisit gifted programming. And it's a great time to offer that professional development as you have new staff. You know, sometimes gifted PD may be offered five years ago, and then there's not, it's not kept up with refreshers. So I feel that it's, it's a good time for all of our teachers to have this um, professional development opportunity. So the corrective action must be completed during the 21-22 school year. 
and it will involve gifted teachers, general ed teachers and administrators. We will receive support from CIU 10 and Patton. Um, we have uh, uh, been made in contact with folks to help us um, provide that professional development. I have a meeting actually next week with, with the folks from CIU 10, so we can try to get it in place and get up and running because it is a lot of professional development and that time. So we wanna be able to possibly roll some of this PD out this summer, maybe use some PLC time. Um, there are, I believe, some asynchronous modules that you could do on their own as well. Um, so that will be helpful. And then the last piece after we do all of the things that we need to correct, PDE will come back into the district and they will pull those files again and they will do a file review to make sure that our documents have improved, our dates are what they should be, um, and go from there to make sure that we've completed our plan. So that was a lot thrown at you all at once. Um, I will entertain questions if any of you feel that you need some clarification or want some additional information. Elizabeth, just real quick, if we only have nine identified students, how were we, what was the identification process up to this point since it was only nine? So Rep, I, I believe they were using some of the criteria, but nothing was in writing. So they were basically being referred by teachers and then going through that child study team, probably looking at some data, but we didn't have formalized numbers to say, if you're in the 90th percentile, we're gonna move you forward to level two from that universal screening. And they really weren't doing a universal screening. So that universal screening means every student in the district is taking that same assessment in those grade levels. And then you're pulling out those students who stand out above that 90th or 95th percentile. So what was happening previously was just teacher referrals, kind of getting the sense from their students in the classroom that they may be in need of gifted services. We should have, we should have far more students and we do, we'll find them through this process and we will grow our gifted program. I'm, I'm very confident about that. So has this process changed? I know years ago, this was this, looks like a similar model that they had used in the past uh, with a lot more additional data it's from what we used to use. Right, Sorry. and from what I understand in the past, there was more of an enrichment program. So it wasn't, there wasn't necessarily that piece of the identification and evaluation process for a GIEP. They had enrichment time that students were identified and I'm not quite sure what that criteria was and they may have been pulled out for some time with a enrichment teacher. Well, I knew they went to that Renzulli model for, for a while. Right. Or a enrichment type of thing. Um, but this looks like the, the old identification process from, that I was familiar with. Right. But with a lot more uh, yep. data. Okay, thanks. Any other board members with a question? Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, this is one of my favorite topics. I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, my, only, my only concern, I guess, is what's the long-term tracking of this? I mean, we don't, I mean, obviously you guys are gonna be on top of this, you're on top of it, it's moving forward. What about five years from now, 10 years from now? I mean, do we need a new policy or, or something to make sure that this isn't going to, like in the past, it was like all of a sudden it was going and it sort of stopped. How, how can we maintain and make sure the continuum keeps going? And, and I think because we've, you know, Megan spoke last week about the MTSS model. This is definitely a piece of that model. This is just the other side of things. These are those students who are above and beyond that core and they need that additional support. So gifted will falls right into those triangles as well. So we will continue to monitor. And if we continue to use that universal screening and we're pulling those that data out in November, we will continue to catch students. What was happening previously is nobody was really monitoring that data to see where all of our kids were at. 
and a lot of it, I believe, was just a referral from the teacher. And a lot of times teachers know they have that sense, you know, that as an instructor of a child who, who is a little bit special and needs something more. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, Dr. Barnhart. Um, we're excited to see how this goes in the next year. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Ms. Long, has anybody signed up to speak this evening? No, there are no visitors signed up to speak. Okay. And Dr. Martin is not with us this evening, so we do not have a superintendent's report. Um, we have any committee meetings in the last week? I think it was curriculum. Oh, uh, curriculum. Oh, that's correct. Uh, curricular, co curricular. Uh, we don't have. Here. Elizabeth, were you there? She was. For curricular, co curricular. Yeah, yes. And um, Jeff. Jeff was there. And um, who else was there? Um, not yes. At the, not at the one they just had. Just this last, just Tuesday. Just this past day. Day. Yeah, I'm just going to look at my notes. Okay. Okay, we have the minutes, right? Jeff, did you want to jump in? You're always very good at this. I wasn't at that one, so I can't jump Oh, that's in. right. I I'm was in the, the other meeting. I'm so sorry. Jump in if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we have the minutes, but my board docs, for some reason, the, me the me this meeting is not on board docs, and it's, it's no big issue, but I don't have the minutes in front of me. It was just a couple of days ago, so it takes some time. You can so. speak to the co curriculum. Okay. Okay, Mr. Hapley, go ahead. Thank um, you. Uh, myself and JT Bittner uh, from Sugar Valley Rural Charter School uh, presented an opportunity for our um, our cheerleaders and our student athletes uh, to participate in a um, uh, competitive spirit league um, as a co as a cooperative agreement with Sugar um, Valley Rural Charter School um, for next year. Uh, the, you know, we, we presented, um, there were several items uh, that, we, that we discussed. Um, the only thing that would um, basically cost us would be uh, for the $100 agreement with the PIAA. Um, and they would basically cover everything as far as uniforms, as far as um, the competition costs, things to that nature. Um, they talked about they're going to cover the uniforms, uh, being that they would be the host school. Uh, however, they would they would entertain a, a wildcat patch of some sort uh, for our student athletes. Um, the only other thing that we would need to provide is transportation, but we kind of discussed it since they come here for a lot of our sports. We don't they don't they don't pay for any transportation, and we don't pay for any transportation, so we'd just be on the student athletes or the parents to to basically transport them for practices. Um, the only thing left that we are gonna do with that is um, I just actually put out a survey this morning, um, survey to see how many student athletes would wanna be interested in that program. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so Mr. Strauss. I'd like to make a motion to pass the entire agenda unless anybody at board member has anything they wish to pull for further discussion. Mr. Strauss, I would like to pull items I3 through I6 and item K1. I3, no, I, I3 through six. I3 through six, <laughs> K1. All right. Um, can I have a second? I will gladly second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Miller. <laughs> All in favor of passing the agenda, except for I3 through six and K1, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So I3 is our final general budget. It does require a roll call vote. Um, can I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to pass I3 final general fund budget. I'll second. Ms. Long? Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Strauss? Yes. Mrs. Donahue? Yes. 
Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Koch? Present. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. I-4 is resolution 122, the Homestead and Farmstead resolution uh, for the purpose of reducing school district property taxes. I'd like to make a motion to pass resolution 122, Homestead and Farmstead. I'll second that too. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Strauss? Yes. Mrs. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Mr. Koch? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. I five is resolution 123 authorizing the business manager to make any necessary revisions in the general fund budget for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021 and report the revisions to the board. I make a motion to pass resolution 123 budget transfers. I'll second again. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Strauss? Yes. Mrs. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Cove? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Motion passes. I-6 is resolution 124 authorizing fund transfers for capital projects and fund commitments for the purposes of medical reserves, PSERS rate stabilization fund, and amounts committed for the purposes of balancing the 2021-2022 budget provided sufficient funds are available for completion of the 2021 financial reports. I'd like to make a motion to pass resolution 124 committed fund. I'll second that. Mr. Strauss? Yes. Mrs. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Mr. Koch? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. And K1 was our athletics and student activities. Uh, Mr. Strauss, you, you need to personally abstain from this one? I need to personally abstain from this one. Okay, so I will make the motion to pass item K1 <laughs> athletics and student activities personnel. Thank you. I will second. <laughs> Mrs. Donahue? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Koch? Yes. Ms. Lynch? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Strauss abstains? Yes, I abstain. Motion passes. Okay. Um, do any other board members have anything else for the good of the board? Yes, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I forgot to mention this during the curricular non-curricular meeting. Um, I just want to thank, thank Stephen and everyone who was involved. There was a great article in the Express newspaper about the Skeet Shooting Club. Um, I can't believe it's, it's so success. It sounds so successful. So whoever's doing any, whatever they're doing. I want to thank you all so much. Uh, super excited about it. Thank you. Okay. So before we end, uh, just another reminder that starting in July, our meetings committee and school board meetings will be open to the public again. Uh, most of them will be here in the boardroom. If anybody has any questions, please contact our board secretary, Tracy Long, and we will still be providing Zoom links also. So. I congratulate the baseball team. Oh, yes. Central Mountain baseball team. They did a great job. Yes. Great season. I was at that game. That was crazy. Well, <laughs> it was a great game. Yeah, that was a hard loss. That's a real tough. Nice. All right. Nice yeah. to see a little school hold up to the big boys. Yep. They did great. Since Mr. Ellen is not here. All right. You take a Yes, I will Jeff, take the honors tonight. Go ahead. Making a motion to adjourn, and I will second that motion. All right. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>